Dear friends, today I will talk about 25 things that every pianist should do, hopefully on daily basis. And actually this list is applicable not only for pianists, but for any instrumentalist or a singer. There are only very few uh, items on this list that are more suitable for pianists than others, but um, we are all musicians and these concepts would apply to um, all of us who wish to uh, live life in music. So the first point, and it might be self-evident, but I am constantly surprised and amazed that it is not apparently self-evident, which is that you need to listen to music and you need to listen a lot of music and not just listen, you need to study. Uh, and what I mean is you actually every day need to study new scores uh, and this should be not just music written for your instrument so if you're a pianist it should be outside of your of the piano repertoire so of course <laughs> you should also listen to the music written for your instrument and know it very well inside out but you should study scores of operas, symphonies, uh, music written for all the different instruments, uh, chamber music, vocal music, uh, choir music, uh, you should study it all. And uh, you should be very knowledgeable about it. And by studying, I mean ideally actually listening to music with scores, because it's a very different uh, way of absorbing music. So if you just have music in the background and and you're writing emails or you're cooking your meals, this doesn't work. This doesn't count. And uh, why do you need to, you may say, well, I have so, so little time and I have so many pieces to learn as is and so many hours to practice. Why do I need to learn, uh, I don't know, quartet repertoire if I'm a pianist? I will never play a single note of this music. Well, you don't need to learn it because this is the only way you will become a complete musician. Uh, you will never become a complete musician if the only thing you know is what you perform and the music written for your instrument. So uh, you will never understand composers. You will never have a full understanding, a full picture of what's going on. You will never be able to come up with great interpretation if you are ignorant. So it's, it's as simple as um, basic as that. Now it's it may feel overwhelming because there is so much great music, um, but it is doable. Uh, just set as little as half an hour. It doesn't have to be much more. Half an hour of concentrated listening every single day to various repertoire. It's very important that you go through the all the different centuries and especially concentrating of music of today which is often very weak point for musicians music of the 20th century and 21st century uh, there is a lot of ignorance uh, there is a lot of prejudice and in order to find something that you will love you need to listen to a lot of music and be knowledgeable about it so the worst type of ignorance is ignorance of people who think they know but actually they don't because they have stopped growing, they have stopped learning long time ago, or maybe they never did, maybe they never were curious enough. And unfortunately, I see this on the highest levels, everywhere uh, musicians just simply stop growing and you need to develop the habit of growing as an artist since you are young, since you are, actually since you are a child, you really should go on this uh, exciting journey of exploration of uh, of this wonderland of music since you are a child. If you haven't developed this habit when you were a child, uh, college uh, student years is the great time. Don't think that you're right now too busy with school, with studies, and then when you graduate, you'll have time to learn all of this extra 
uh, extra material that is that may not be included in your studies in your classes and all schools uh, curriculum is extremely limited so never count on any schools to provide you with a full uh, knowledge or full uh, curriculum of what you need to know as a musician that just goes out of the window all real education is self-education regardless of the high uh, quality of teachers and uh, schools that you might be attending so unless you have and develop this inner habit and it's a it's a muscle it's a learning muscle and learning need to grow every day and to learn every day uh, nobody will feed you uh, your education it just doesn't work this way so uh, second um, attend especially especially during your school years so you may not uh, have uh, time uh, or, or you actually become you turn on the other side but as when you are studying attend and watch music master classes as much as possible and again don't limit them only to your instrument uh, attend uh, master classes of singers uh, violinists conductors you will learn a great deal and you may learn certain things you would not be able to learn if you only attend master classes of your own instrument and um, it's uh, uh, it's very important it's a great opportunity to learn and to learn from various uh, various professors various uh, backgrounds um, so whenever you are in the festival in conservatory setting and you have an opportunity to attend a master class do so almost regardless what type of instrument it is uh, and what type of mo uh, subject of the master class is go uh, because it's a, you can almost learn as much by attending it as participating in it so of course participation is a little bit different uh, but you can learn almost just as much by attending and sometimes more because you are in a way you're an observer so you're free from the your own concerns of uh, I don't know your self-image or whatever it is so you are purely able to absorb uh, third you need to become extremely knowledgeable not only about music but about other arts and I cannot emphasize the importance of it you have to read a lot read a lot of fiction read a lot of poetry read a lot of great literature uh, you need to attend museums attend exhibitions attend uh, exhibitions of modern art now you may again say well why do I need to have so uh, you know so few hours in a day uh, well you again you need to do it in order to become a complete artist because uh, composers who music you played were inspired by the certain uh, um, artworks certain certain uh, uh, novels they were reading certain poems it was part of they are uh, spiritual artistic uh, creative uh, making that all went into the music so music it doesn't live in the empty space empty vacuum no it's deeply connected and influenced by other art forms and you need to understand those art forms the art styles how art develops and it's all connected the way music developed, uh, the way literature developed, art, visual art developed, uh, architecture, it's all interconnected. You need to be able to see the larger picture, understand the larger picture. You may not be able to be knowledgeable enough to teach course in, uh, I don't know, in paintings or, uh, but you need to have the general knowledge. You need to be able to see a painting and be able to guess with a certain degree of certainty let's say it's a painting you see for the first time you need to be able to uh, guesstimate uh, and be correct about for example what century this painting is from what country possible artists uh, possible depiction of the theme if there is a certain certain theme um, 
so you have to understand uh, all those concepts uh, fourth point go to as many concerts as possible uh, and go to good concerts great concerts and bad concerts now you may ask okay i understand okay great concerts we all know why we should we should listen to them but why who, who needs bad concerts and why should one attend them well it's actually you can learn a lot uh you can learn a lot from uh so so concerts because they teach you what not to do and you may be doing some of those things in your own performances and when you see somebody else uh, doing those things it provides you perspective and provides you um understanding why it doesn't work why there are certain things you should be careful should avoid how is it uh, from the other side so if you only uh, have this goal of listening to great concerts only well first of all there is no way to know even if it is a great performer or somebody with a great reputation may have a bad day so so you can have famous names and a lot of the times very famous names give so 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 performances um uh, happens so we are human uh, so do go to a lot of concerts listen to the concerts uh, of course if you have somebody an artist you respect a lot uh, who is in your town and who is giving a recital or performance with the orchestra or conducting an orchestra uh, do everything possible to get to this concert and listen live because there is a certain magic we all know about live performances <laughs> Um, but also go to performances of your colleagues, of other students uh, in your school and see, see what they do well and what they can do better and how it all applies to your own development. Um, five, play chamber music with best colleagues you can find. Now, this is very important and it's uh, something especially important, I mean, it's important for everyone, but uh, I think often it happens in the conservatory setting with pianists that we get very focused on uh, solo repertoire. It also happens a lot, for example, with violinists, so we all want to be soloists. Now, there is nothing wrong about wanting to be soloists, uh, but in order to be a great soloist, guess what? You need to be a great chamber music musician. And there is an uh, amazing amount of amazing literature written for chamber music. And uh, why did I say that uh, with best colleagues possible? Is because it's the absolutely best learning uh, tool for you. You can learn from playing chamber music perhaps more than anything else. Uh, you can learn musicianship, you can learn collaboration, you can learn telepathy, you can learn um, how to discuss and decide on interpretations when there is more than one person. Uh, so if you have, I don't know, piano quintet, uh, five people, five personalities, five different interpretations, each thinks his interpretation or her is the only right one, disagreements, uh how do you solve all of these puzzles how do you uh, become sensitive how you come to the to this magical moment when you can actually almost read each other's thoughts know exactly uh, what the other one is doing how be able to see again the the complete picture rather than your own separate part uh and I also want to mention in the schools, whenever you have opportunity to attend rehearsals, uh, for example, uh, there are often possibility to attend uh, orchestral rehearsals, see how conductor works with orchestra. Those are golden. Uh, attend the uh, rehearsals of faculty members who are preparing for the concerts. Any opportunity to attend rehearsals of professional, uh, successful, uh, uh, inspiring players do so because this is how you learn the alchemy 
of rehearsing technique. Um, six point, uh, read about composers, read about their lives. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this is actually something that is very minimal in uh, conservatory trainings. We know only like some stupid basics that don't make any difference. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the composers, you spent, you spent your lives, you spent hours and hours on end practicing music written by some guy, Beethoven, without knowing a thing about him. Okay, you know, well, okay, he lived in Vienna. Okay, big deal. Uh, half of the world lived in Vienna at some point. So, um, but who was he? What was he like? Uh, there is this tendency of putting great uh, f uh, famous names on a pedestal. So there is like this bust of Beethoven, which has absolutely nothing to do with his music, and which we mentally put in our mind. And instead of, instead of attempting to understand this person who wrote this music and know events of his life, know when he wrote this specific piece, we are spending hours, hours, hours on end practicing uh, without having any clue what year was it written? What was he reading at the time? What was his major influences? What struggles he encountered? Now you can say all of it is completely irrelevant. Only what matters the notes he put on the page. But the notes is just a code. It's just a code for us to interpret. So, uh, and unless you have some kind of a feeling, some kind of understanding of this person, uh, well, was he was 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 he kind? Was he angry type of person? Was he? Uh, maybe it's all irrelevant. But the closer you get, the more knowledgeable you get, the more you understand what was important for him. What did he value in the in performance? If you have no idea what he valued in performance, how can you even attempt to get some kind of a convincing interpretation for this music? So you must do a lot of research and a lot of research that is outside of curriculum. Uh, you must know what uh, uh, artists he liked, what, uh, what was he reading, what was influenced. Get research, like research. Research is really going beyond the frames of easily available uh, information that's given to you on the plate. So do that. Do that, do that, do that. It will completely change your relationship with music. You will realize how very alive music is, even music written uh, centuries ago, that it's all matter. The composer was making decisions and he had a huge array of possibilities when he was marking certain things in the score. You will actually gain much more insight and interpretation in uh, what goes into the musical score. You will understand music notation much more. We think we understand music notation, but let me tell you, 99% of us don't. We have no idea what it is, and we don't realize how fragile and how imperfect it is, and how limited music notation is, and therefore how to understand and appreciate choices that composer makes and respect them. You will, you will gain a completely new respect of what's in the score if you understand a little bit more of what composers go through. For example, if you haven't read, let's say, Prokofiev diaries, you should just drop anything you're doing and you should immerse yourself in reading Prokofiev's diaries because here is an example of a great composer and he was a great composer, whether you like his music or not. Uh, he was also a very talented writer who was a great diarist. And he was writing about all his thoughts, struggles, daily situations, daily choices into his diary. And this diary, every musician should read regardless of what he does. Uh, to gain some sort of insight of what goes into the process of music composition. Another diary I can highly recommend to you is uh, the Diaries of Ned Roram, who is our contemporary. He's alive, he's 98, 
and he has been keeping diaries all his life. You may not like his music or you may like his music. Irrelevant. This is a diary of a composer. This is in unique insight, which can be um, really helping you to understand what was going on through the mind of other composers. Of course, everyone is different, but it's the same craft and it's the same struggles and not much changes. Let me tell you, when you read Prokofiev's diary written at the beginning of the 20th century, you feel it as if it was written today. Not much changes. Uh, so read. Um, seventh point, take care of your body. Um, playing musical instrument and living life of a uh, concert pianist, well, in my case, um, if you're a violinist or um, it doesn't matter, a singer, um, living a life of a concert musician, professional musician, professional performer, is not unlike a sportsman's life. Uh, we um, perform with our bodies. Our bodies become an instrument. So if you don't take care of your body, you may be, the, maybe, maybe you're the greatest performer ever lived in your mind if you cannot do it physically. So it, again, this seems self-evident, but there is so little of physical uh, education in music schools, it blows my mind. So, and you have to take care of yourself. Nobody will do it for you. Uh, you have to learn about proper nutrition. Now, I learned it hard way, I can say. Uh, I'm kind of a, someone who uh, ignored uh, this point a lot of the time. But uh, I'm still uh, <laughs> I'm still working on it now uh, more than ever before. You have to learn about proper nutrition, what you put into your body, what works as a fuel for your body, not as um, not something that gives you huge, for example, sugar spikes, or uh, not something that will make you jitter, but something that is actual fuel that is good for you. And you need to uh, have a, develop a regimen of physical activity, which is very important, very, very important. Uh, you, you need to walk, uh, you need to make 10,000 steps every day. Now, because we sit all the time, so uh, it's especially important. You need to develop muscles, you need to develop muscles to hold your body, to help you not to develop back problems uh, later on, uh, help you to develop certain muscles that you do need uh, for your playing or for conducting or uh, whatever it is you're doing. So please, please do not only live in your mind. Don't forget about your body because your body, what will, what is it going to do if you keep on ignoring it? You may be young and healthy right now and you think, I can do it, I don't have to take care of it, I'm fine. Well, your body will send you warning signals and you will ignore them. And it will send you more warning signals and you will ignore them until it will send you such a warning signal that you will not be able to ignore it. And who knows, this warning signal may be the end of your career. Hopefully not. Hopefully at some point you will listen and it will be still possible for you to take care of it so and sooner or later in your life i guarantee you if you're ignoring your body completely and you're just going on your good genes or good uh, uh, health that was given you by your youth uh, sooner or later uh, ignoring will stop and um, it can be a very very tough wake-up call and it's better if it doesn't come to that uh, so so please learn to take care of your body. Again, it doesn't have to be something um, tremendous, something that takes much time. Just set 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day. 
of, of exercise, 30 minutes of day of acknowledging and saying thank you to your body and saying, yes, I understand. I'm not only my mind, but I'm also my body and I'm grateful for it. Because if I would be just floating as a mind, as an idea, as a wavelength, well, I wouldn't be able to play instrument. So say thank you to your body. Uh, eight, take care of your mind. Now, this is again something that we ignore uh, because uh, we, go, uh, we live very, very stressful lives. Lives we have uh, so much to learn, so many hours to practice, and it takes so much discipline, so much pressure. Uh, we forget that we also have to take care of our mind. Now, how do we take care of our mind? Well, learn meditation. Uh, learn med different meditation techniques. This will also be very, very important for you. For example, to be able to conquer uh, stage fright uh, if you have nerves before your performance. Uh, the meditation techniques will give you tools how to deal with yourself. Uh, you may want to learn uh, neurolinguistics, how to talk to yourself. Uh, now, that sounds totally weird. Why do I need to learn to talk to myself? Well, you do need to learn to talk to yourself if you want to perform your best. You need to know what uh, verbal signals bring out your best performances. Uh, what visual uh, techniques can bring out your best performances. How to ground yourself. How to be able to... Uh, when, I was, when I was a child, my mom used to uh, tell me when you're on stage, you should grow your ears. Your ears should be become so, so big. They're as big as the hole itself. So, and it was a very helpful image. Or she would sometimes say, well, take your ears and place them on the last row of the hole. So when you play yourself, you listen, not with your ears here, but with your ears that you place in the back row of the hole. Uh, now that sounds very funny, but I think all musicians will understand what I mean. And why is it so crucial? Because acoustics on stage are different uh, than acoustics in the hall, especially if we're playing in big hall. So we need to be able to imagine and with a great degree of accuracy how the sound how it sounds in the last row of the hole so uh, it becomes a very useful technique and it's in some ways it's also a type of a meditation visualization uh, the how we what we visualize what we uh, learn another uh, image that my mom was uh, giving me when i was uh, um, when i was a child she would say well you you should play imaginary piano not the real piano but imaginary piano so when you play you uh, look upwards so you're not uh, so bound to the keyboard and you imagine the ideal piano ideal playing ideal phrasing ideal intonation how it would be in the absolutely ideal hall uh, played by the greatest pianist and you imagine that and then you play that uh, using the real piano again It's a it's a great technique. It sounds maybe very childish But if you if you can visualize this this uh, certainly uh, Allows your imagination to flow allows you to search for the best uh, interpretation you can come up with uh, best sound you can come up with and then figure out a way to bring it from uh, this uh, instrument that you are actually in reality playing and make sure that's what sounds is uh, what you are how you're bringing these two worlds together um, uh, now nine point is connected again to taking care of yourself uh, in um, body and mind and uh, this is something that I recommend to learn to all uh, instrumentalists uh, singers uh, actors um, which to take classes in Alexander technique now I was very fortunate because I took uh, I don't remember right now if it was a semester or it was two semesters at Juilliard school uh, when I studied of Alexander technique and uh, it's actually a technique that was as far as I remember developed I think for musicians and actors and uh, uh, it's essentially a technique that teaches you to be able to analyze what's going on in your body. Whether you have tension, uh, how the energy flows through you, um, and to be able to, while you perform, 
and this is very important, to be able to assign a small part of your consciousness to be an observer of what's going on in your body. So as you see, like the moment I talk about Alexander technique, sort of my um, posture is better, uh, my shoulders get down, uh, I feel more centered, I feel more relaxed. Um, and it's a great uh, way to learn this, this valuable technique. Uh, you should also uh, learn, um, and now this is this actually next point, uh, so point 10. You should learn how to protect your hands. Uh, this is part, part, it should be a whole another video about it because so many of us develop problems. And uh, frankly, when I see young pianists play, I would say I see problems in 80% of them, tensions, uh, especially tensions in the neck and shoulder area. Uh, now, uh, there can be also tensions in the arms. Now, all of those tensions, you may not yet feel that they're affecting your playing. But trust me, it's not possible to have a successful and long and sustainable career if you have harmful tensions in your body and pretty much all of them are, are harmful uh, with continuous use, it becomes progressive. So uh, you need to learn, and a lot, a lot of pianists, it's kind of a taboo thing to talk about, but they develop hand problems, uh, arms problems, pains, uh, they don't know how to deal with it. And it especially happens at the point, uh, let's say you're a young pianist, a successful pianist, you won some competitions, you gra just graduated and you have, uh, suddenly you have a lot of concerts uh, that you're playing, you learn a lot of new repertoire, so there's constant stress, travel, and all of a sudden you're realizing that you're constantly having pain. And the more you play and the harder repertoire you play, uh, that you're actually playing through pain. And unless, you are careful and you know what to do in those situations and you take it seriously and don't allow it to escalate it can be the stop of a very promising start so it can be it, it can be the end of your career and as we all know there are wonderful famous pianists who have developed uh, such problems and uh, usually they are with the right hand because it's uh, the, our dominion hand uh, our pinkies are weaker but have a lot of the times melodic materials in the uh, in the octaves or in the chords uh, so we do tend to develop more tension in the right hand uh, so much so that there is a whole repertoire for the left hand alone that just shows you how many historically pianists threw into their right hand now you don't want to do that so you have to become very very knowledgeable very attentive uh, very careful extremely better better careful and sorry in those cases uh, never push yourself to play through pain um, but you need to get knowledgeable about what to do uh, something that I uh, recommend uh, watch uh, videos made by Golansky Institute I think it's called Tauber method uh, but Golansky Institute does a lot of work that explains um, actually the physicality of playing piano something that we don't learn in school and how to deal with any physical tensions problems and so on in the best possible way so I recommend them highly uh, and so and you uh, also need to develop certain technique what to do with your hands uh, what to maybe uh, certain creams you can put on your hands certain icing or when to ice when to put heat all of this uh, inner methods uh, like before the concert after the concert um, you need to get very knowledgeable, very careful, and um, and really, really study it. And if at any point you have pain, stop. Stop right there. It's a warning sign. We are not supposed to play through pain. We are not supposed to have pain when we play. 
uh, it's a warning that our signal that our body gives us to pay attention something wrong is going on if you don't pay attention you keep on playing through pain you keep on going on as if nothing uh, if you soldier through it well you will lose the war so next one um Eleventh point is <laughs> learn how to hear. So this may be uh, again sounds weird. Well, we have our ears; we can hear. But there is so much to this art of hearing in uh, music. Um, certain points I already mentioned before: learning how to hear yourself in different acoustics, different halls, different pianos. Uh, from different points in the whole, uh, how to hear yourself objectively, and uh, um, for example, a simple tool can be uh, constantly record when you're playing and listen back because it gives you objective pairs of ears. Um, but what I uh, say actually by learning how to hear it is um, also applies learn how to hear sound uh, there are thousands and thousands of gradation of sound and you need to um, you need to learn how to distinguish those gradations this by the way can also teach you if you have tension in your body uh, so it goes both ways you may find your tension by absorbing your body but you may also find it through the quality of your sound because if you have tension anywhere in your body you're not going to produce exactly the sound the ideal sound that you want to produce and uh, there is specific qualities that alter the sound if you have tensions so you that may also give you certain warning signal that you have tension in your body by the quality of your sound um but um i also i also mean it uh that brings me actually to the next point uh you need to be able to learn how to hear music without your instrument you need to be able to hear music by looking at the score only even if the score you've never heard before this inner ear is the most important tool musician has. Now everybody says what a great tragedy was for Beethoven, he wasn't able to hear. Uh, now it would be a much greater tragedy if he didn't have his uh, eyesight because he wouldn't be able to write down his music. He had no problem hearing his music. Zero problem! He heard it all inside of his head. He heard it much better than any performances. I mean the performances of his time, of his premieres were very lousy. Uh, but he was able to hear the best possible performances in his head. This is how composer hears music. Composer first hears music, then writes it down. As performers, it's very important that we recreate this process because that goes to the core of understanding feeling uh, music. So I would say with most of the performers, the process is very different. We play the piece our fingers start guiding us towards certain interpretation and then we develop that interpretation based on how it feels in our hands whereas the other approach that's that's instrumentalist's approach what i want you to do is to learn musician's approach composer's approach which is you hear, you develop interpretation in your inner ear, and then you train your fingers to uh, get to this as close as possible to this ideal interpretation, the interpretation that, that doesn't have any physical limitations, any instrumental limitations. So don't forget, uh, music is a pure art form. So yes, we use instruments for it, but all instruments have limitations. So music in its finest, most abstract form 
doesn't have those instrument those limitations this is like this imaginary piano that my mother was teaching me to play as a child in imagination piano can have all orchestral sounds unlimited possibilities unlimited to uh, most wonderful acoustics it can do magic so when you are learning uh, your repertoire you need to be able to develop to go back to this composer's mentality and to develop the best interpretation of this music regardless of physical uh, uh, limitations or physical tendencies and then adjust and and uh, train yourself, train your technique to fit that interpretation. So it's the question who is leading the way, who is the driver? And uh, um, for, again, as I said, for most uh, instrumentalists, it is their technique, it's their fingers, it's that's how they find their ideal interpretation, through experimenting with their fingers. So I'm not saying it's wrong. Uh, it, it, it can be also a good way to approach, but you need to be able at least to do both. And ideally between the two, the other approach need to be leading. Is the approach when you look at the piece, you create in your inner ear the ideal interpretation. You develop it and then uh, as you learn it, uh, you bring it as close as possible. And of course, with time it can adjust, it can change, uh, it's all very flexible, it's all, uh, you need to adjust to the hole and so on and so on, it's all understandable. But uh, train, train, train your inner ear. Um, so, uh, fingers should follow uh, imagination. Uh, um, and uh, uh, learn this point 13 learn to practice without instrument now uh, there is a whole technique another perhaps it deserves another video there is a, a whole technique um, for pianists now i'm talking about pianists because that's what i know uh, i think it's also possible to a degree to visualize playing any instrument um, i uh, know how it works for piano um, but there is a whole uh, technique of how you can practice without a, an actual instrument in front of you. It's extremely useful. Uh, it's especially useful because we spend a lot of time traveling, being on the plane and so on, where we actually without instrument. But it's also useful even when you don't have an instrument. Or, I mean, when you actually have an access to the instrument, but it's still useful from time to time to practice without instrument. Um, now, number 14 point, uh, this video is getting way too long, um, but uh, I will, I'll manage to get through. So number 14 point, uh, it, again, self-evident, learn how to practice. Now I'm in it with the instrument. Uh, again, this may be very self-evident, but I'm actually amazed that, um, at least in this student conservatory environment, there is um, a lot of uh, actual lack of knowledge of how to practice. So how do you practice? And we all know that if you know how to practice, how to structure your time, what to work on, what to concentrate on, uh, that uh, you can uh, do miracles in much smaller amount of time than practicing without plan, without full understanding of the steps, how you're going to learn a certain piece. Uh, you may spend much, much more time. And also bear in mind, if you're practicing the wrong way, you're actually hurting yourself rather than helping because you're developing bad habits. So if you're practicing, I don't know, you're practicing a passage, but you're going about the whole thing wrong way. Uh, you are developing bad habits that will uh, be very difficult to overcome later on. You're possibly developing physical problems that will take you much more time to undo later on. If you're repeating certain mistakes you're making, uh, again, you are uh, uh, training your brain ways to make those mistakes. So it's very important to actually know how to structure your practice time. 
So let's say you have, I don't know, you have four hours. How are you going to spend these four hours? Let's say you are starting to learn a new piece. How do you go about learning new piece? What do you do? Do you just play? Do you sit right through it? Do you listen to interpretations of others? Do you make analysis? Do you analyze structure? Do you just see what happens? Do you just try to bring first, uh, I don't know, to learn the first movement so you can memorize it for the next lesson? How do you go about it? So learn how to practice. Ask, I don't know, all teachers you meet because the techniques are different and you may learn something valuable from different teachers. And um, this is actually is, uh, brings me to another point which I don't have uh, on this list. Uh, seek opportunity to learn from as many uh, people as possible. Again, directly or indirectly related to your instrument. Now, there is always this kind of um, possessive uh, atmosphere that tends to be in the music schools where you have your teacher and it's like marriage. So uh, the relationship gets one to one. And uh, by marriage, I mean you're not supposed to uh, get advice from other teachers or your teacher may feel you're betraying him or her or that you're showing insecurity about your uh, teaching. And a lot of these unspoken tensions go on uh, in music conservatories. So, uh, so you, have to, you have to be delicate as not to hurt feelings of your teacher, but you should always find every possibility to learn from as many people as you can. And this is where master classes, I'm bringing back this point of master classes, are very valuable because it's an official uh, recognized way for you to learn from others, from other professors, other... Uh, so this is something that's not going to get your teacher mad. But uh, seek for those opportunities. Um, now, next one, uh, point 15, work with living composers and living repertoire. Find music of our time that you feel passionate about. This is a hugely important point. I cannot, I cannot emphasize enough importance of this point. Uh, a lot of students feel they have to um, spend so much time uh, perfecting the, uh, the classical uh, Baroque and Romantic repertoire. They feel no desire or need for contemporary repertoire. Now by contemporary, I don't mean Prokofiev and I don't mean Shostakovich, I mean living composers. I mean composers who are still alive, yeah. Uh, and living repertoire, music that that is being written now or uh, being written recently, music of our time. Now, you may not like a lot of this music, but let me tell you, you don't like it because you don't know enough of it. And as if with everything else, it takes effort. It takes, uh, it takes this desire to go further, to seek beyond the frame. And let me promise you, if you make this effort, you will, your artistry will be so enriched. If you have, take every opportunity to work with a living composer because um, some of these experiences may be absolutely amazing. Some of them may be not so amazing. Some of them can leave you puzzled. But it's very important because it again gives you a glimpse into what goes through composer's mind, how alive music is is how alive the choices try to work with living composers on regular repertoire on standard repertoire because they may see music they may approach this notation that you think you know but from the different understanding next point um, learn to play organ and harpsichord this is for pianists uh, study with teachers um, who can guide you to play uh, organ and harpsichord. Now, of course, they are different instruments. So um, you need it in order to be able to understand and gain some very uh, special insight into the music 
of, for example, Bach, uh, Mozart, and other composers who played these instruments. And you can actually only gain these insights if you have experience of playing it, of playing it. And, for example, how how I how can you be expressive without having piano pedal? How can you be expressive without having ability to do uh, to create crescendo diminuendo the way uh, modern pianos uh, can do it? Uh, how you can use uh, agogics? How can you use uh, articulation uh, rhythm um, as expressive devices? Uh, the physical ex experience of learning and uh, you must not do it by yourself it's very important that you study these instruments with a teacher because if you're simply going to play it the way you play piano you're not going to learn much from the experience so but i very much advise for all pianists to have um, a year of uh, learning harpsichord and maybe a year of learning how to play organ. Not to play these instruments professionally, but to gain a very valuable insight uh, into how to uh, play that repertoire and apply that insight or be able to apply some of this insight into piano playing and in understanding what how composers who wrote that music, uh, uh, what, what, did they, what, what did it feel like? To, for them to play that music. Um, next point is um, for, I think, all musicians uh, should take conducting lessons. Again, the same point. This is not for you to become conductors. Uh, but it's extremely important to be able to conduct through the musical score, through the music that you're playing. Because again, if you put yourself in the shoes, in the mentality of conductor, you see suddenly see music from a different perspective and you need this perspective even if all your plan is a single line not an orchestral score but just a single line you uh conductors shape energy they shape form so it's extremely valuable perspective uh that uh, one can gain from taking conductors uh, le lessons with conductors and also it will give you better tools in reading orchestral scores uh, in uh, um, which you absolutely need well you need it in any case but also you need it uh, when you uh, study concertos repertoire and so on um, take uh, orchestration and instrumentation lessons Again, it will help you to um, be able to understand different instruments, read orchestral scores. You need it in any case. Uh, you need to have this knowledge as a complete musician. Um, the next one uh, is uh, what I already mentioned, to seek advice of different teachers. Uh, by teachers, I don't mean necessarily teachers of your instrument. But it can be an amazing literature professor. Uh, it can be um, you can we have ability to learn every every person whom we meet, especially if it is a person in the very creative surrounding, uh, such as conservatory or university. A person has a gift of knowledge that we can take, and if we are open for it, uh, so I uh, learn for opportunities to learn from people and it can be also human uh, lessons uh, how to be how to be a person how to be a better better human being um, how to approach life so it doesn't always have to be professional advice um, uh, uh, number 20 is uh, always try out your programs so you should never be in the situation when you are playing a program for an audience for the first time. There should never be first time in front of the audience. So, and uh, there is a um, double-edged uh, sword here because, uh, well, first, of course, you should play through the programs by yourself, pretending that you're playing for the audience. And it's very important that you play a number of times before you play for other people. 
uh, and there are many things that happen when you play through the program uh, and by program I mean if you have of course more than one work uh, it doesn't have to be full recital but uh, whatever your performance is you have to be able to play from the beginning to the end uh, pretending you're playing for other people on stage uh, record yourself uh, listen back uh, right away you will find places which uh, maybe you felt more unsure of uh, places that need work what's very important is that the first time you play for people is after you had this repeated experience of playing without people in the room uh, playing by yourself because uh, simply because when we play for people uh, even if it's just a small group of friends that you're trying out the program, uh, we feel different. It's something happens. The chemistry changes, uh, one may get more nervous. And uh, where you have possibility for things to go wrong, they may go wrong. And it's important that this doesn't happen too often uh, when you play um, for people and uh, because when you have negative experience, for example, like a memory slip during a performance for people, uh, it engraves something in your brain about this spot. So even though you may be uh, working more on this place which caused the problem, next time you will get to this place, you will remember, oh, last time I played it for the audience, I messed up there. And this thought by itself may <laughs> make it happen again. So, uh, in other words, uh, you should be sufficiently ready when you play, when you try out your program. And of course, uh, you have to try out program for different people or maybe for the same people, better for different people, uh, so that you have this repeated experience and hopefully in different places. Uh, that can be just your school friends or it can be your family, uh, almost doesn't matter, uh, but at least play through the program about three times uh, before you actually bring it on stage for the first time in a real whole situation. So, and a lot of this actually goes, uh, it's not only for students, but I know many professional, many concert artists with years of experience, great reputation, that still uh, play through their programs for, uh, when they do something for the first time. Of course, it's, if it's a piece you played a million times, if it's a program you played a lot, you don't need to do it again. You, you, can, you can just play what you need to play. It's hard enough and it's often enough. But if it's something that you're doing for the first time, you need to develop the positive experience of uh, being able to do it. So next, uh, point 21, uh, listen to the great masters of the past. Uh, we live in the incredible time when now it is possible to um, access videos that uh, were never um, available before and to access it, access it very easily. I remember at the time when I was studying, it was so difficult to find any, um, any videos uh, at all and uh, you had to go to the libraries, you had to find videotapes of uh, uh, musicians such as, for example, Horowitz or Rachmaninoff or uh, great conductors of the past. You had to actually rent them. Um, so it was, uh, even at the Juliet Library, it was not so easy to find. Uh, there were some videos available there to watch, but generally it was, uh, big hassle to get access to great uh, videos of the musicians uh, from the past and now we have it and it's so easy. So do watch, analyze uh, both videos and audios of great masters of the past and as you listen and as you learn from them, uh, think how come they're so individual, they're so different from each other. Whereas so many of uh, living uh, musicians, they kind of have the same sound, the same, you can't really hear difference if you just hearing them on the radio, let's say. Um, whereas so much uh, individuality and character was quite more present in the performances of the great masters of the past. You can learn a lot from 
them. You should also, of course, watch Great Masters of Today. Uh, I'm not belittling our time at all. I think we live in an absolutely uh, incredible time and a time when there is, uh, again, so much information available and so much knowledge and access to information for those who are willing to make effort and uh, make extra steps. Um, so uh, use this knowledge uh, uh, and uh, learn from it and uh, uh, you can learn from the dead uh, almost as much and sometimes more and sometimes very different things that you can live from the living but uh, dead are there and they keep on influencing us and it's a, it's a great thing. Um, the uh, other thing is uh, number 22 is get out of your comfort zone uh, take risks uh, constantly challenge yourself uh, dare yourself um, uh, go in the direction of your fears uh, they're there for, the, for a good reason and especially when you are in the safe environment of the school uh, you really should make effort to get out of your comfort zone because ultimately you will never find out who you are as a person or as an artist if you constantly stay in your comfort zone and getting out of your comfort zone is essential also after you graduate from schools from conservatories it's something that allows us to grow as artists we are not in this uh, world of music for comfort or for control or for uh, other things or for money or for any of those earthy matters. We went into this incredibly difficult uh, profession because we were searching for uh, something outside of this uh, realm of the everyday um, life, uh, something transcendental. Uh, this uh, flicker of perfection, uh, perfection that is perhaps unreachable, but that allows us this direction, uh, direction of growth. And uh, let me tell you, this direction doesn't come with a comfort zone. So if you seek comfort, um, that ultimate... Um, that ultimate uh, stifling of creativity and by comfort I don't mean uh, uncomfortable surrounding of your life no uh, you should have everything in your life designed to maximize uh, your artistry but by stepping out of your comfort zone I mean uh, challenging yourself in various ways playing the repertoire that you are not familiar with uh, that is new to you, that are masters that are new to you, constantly challenging to grow, uh, constantly questioning what you know, constantly learning. And the beauty in music is that there is never end to what you can learn. Um, then uh, 23rd is keep a diary. Uh, keep a diary of your progress, keep a diary of your journey, keep a diary of your practicing. Um, you keep planning of your practicing um, actually know give yourself a, a understanding of uh, well how do you spend time practicing how much time do you spend uh, now there is no recipe of how much one should practice but at least one needs to be able to be honest with, with oneself and to know uh, really what is the amount of time you spend growing on your art and actually at your instrument and also without your instrument but uh, also just being able to understand how you spend your time um, and uh, uh, 24 is uh, learn how to practice in slow tempos it's very important uh, and it's very important to do it correctly. Uh, I'm not going to go into reasons why it is important uh, and how to do it, but uh, it is a very important technique for any repertoire and uh, also um, it's something that 
can again prevent injuries it can uh, um, sort of fine-tune uh, even or especially the repertoire that you know very well as well as really prepare you for the new repertoire um, so but it's important to do it correctly if you're just simply practicing in a slow tempo uh, not fully understanding why you're doing so you're wasting your time uh, then the last one I would say uh, the importance of creative routines um, by routines I mean well it can be your practicing routine but uh, perhaps even more so uh, the routine how and what do you do the day of performance uh, know what works for you uh, do you need to take a nap uh, what kind of uh, uh, day it needs to be do you need to practice how much you need to practice uh, when do you need to come to the concert hall what to do after the concert uh, and this may be strange because uh, to many um, people it seems well after the concert you go and uh, <laughs> I don't know, you have a reception <laughs> uh, or you get drunk but maybe uh, maybe this is uh, actually something that is counterproductive maybe you have a concert next day uh, maybe there is certain actually practicing that needs to be done after you just played a program and uh, uh, maybe you need to revisit certain places and uh, revisit them maybe in slow tempo uh, I'm not saying exactly because uh, it's individual for each artist but you need to develop certain routines you need to know what works for you and uh, the routines if you know that you have a concert next day uh, what you should do a night before a day before uh, so you really need to know yourself uh, can you be with people before you go to the concert uh, before you play in a concert uh, or do you need to be alone do you need to, to meditate or can you actually have a discussion or pre-concert lecture uh, would it affect you negatively or can you just simply go straight into the playing um, again certain things uh, may work for certain people not for others you need to know exactly what works for you you need to be able to have techniques to cope with things when they don't go your way because sometimes they will not sometimes you may be running to the concert at the la last minute because your plane is late or because there was a i don't know crash uh on uh, some kind of uh, delay that is completely out of your control uh so maybe you need to calculate to be in the concert hall three hours before the concert i don't know what it is for your peace of mind for your best concentration but you need to know yourself you need to experiment and see what works best for you which perhaps meditative techniques which restorative techniques uh, does it help you to have a nap before the concert uh, what should you have in your dressing room and this may be important if you if you have for example a long recital what do you do in the intermission uh, do you eat something um, what type if you eat something what type uh, what do you eat uh, what type of uh, food will give you energy what type of drinks uh, would coffee help or would coffee uh, make you have jitters uh, should you keep a water bottle behind the stage uh, um, should you have a fan uh, uh, should you have some maybe a uh, cold uh, wet towel what do you need so and uh, it's important that you develop this repertoire of coping techniques because life is life things often don't go our way yes we can control certain surroundings uh, we can uh, know what the best surroundings are but we also need to be able to function when we don't have the best surroundings and we should still be able to deliver our very very best work regardless so uh, the show must go on and with this i hope you find some of these um, points helpful in um, whatever your instrument is uh, as i mentioned i designed them mainly with pianists concert pianists in mind uh, with students uh, learning uh, how to become uh, professional pianists but i think a lot of these 
points can uh, transfer very well to any other instrument uh, or to singers as well and uh, um, I hope that you found some of it uh, helpful and please uh, do not hesitate and ask me any questions if you have special routines for example uh, I would be very curious to know what are your routines before and after performance uh, what are your um, practicing routines um, what do you like to have for fuel uh, before the concert what, what type of food um, what were some of your best lessons or tips uh, um, on uh, learning your instrument so any of my channel thank you